During the 600s and 700s, the Japanese imperial court built a powerful centralized government, the Ritsuryo state. But it then spent the following centuries dismantling that state, replacing the conscript army with militias, replacing a centralized tax system with tax farming, and moving lots of land off the tax rolls. The overall effect of this process was that it gradually moved power from the capital to the countryside. So today, let's turn our attention to the countryside. What was going on in the rest of Japan while the court in Kyoto was focused on itself? Now, at the lowest level of control, we really don't know who was in charge in the provinces during the Heian period. The records are too fragmentary. But we have a much better understanding of the upper levels of local control, the rural elite who linked the countryside with the capital. That elite was made up of the lesser nobility, petty nobles who still had distant ties to the imperial line. And the two main families during the Heian period were the Genji, also known as the Minamoto, and the Heike, also known as the Taira. Now, a brief digression. How is it that the Taira and the Heike are the same thing, and the Genji and the Minamoto are the same thing? To answer that, let's go back to an important point about the Japanese language. Japanese can also use Chinese readings of characters, so many words have two pronunciations but the same meaning. So saying that Genji and Minamoto are interchangeable, that's like saying that Mr. Taylor and Mr. Schneider are the same because Schneider is the German word for Taylor. Now, these two powerful clans, the Heike and the Genji, both had a foot in either world, the imperial court and the countryside. As for the court, yes, they were part of the Kyoto nobility, but they were at the very bottom. Their influence did not approach that of the powerful Fujiwara house. Instead, they were considered unsophisticated country cousins. But out in the provinces, Minamoto and Heike clans, they were quite powerful. They held together bands of tough and rowdy warriors who squeezed taxes out of farmers. By and large, these country cousins of the Kyoto nobility, they respected the authority of the capital. They understood their specific place in the hierarchy. Although there were signs of trouble relatively early in the Heian period. For example, the 10th century rebellion of Taira no Masakado. He was a minor provincial official in what is today the Tokyo area, and he became embroiled in a fierce feud within his own clan. He was fighting against people like his own cousin and his own father-in-law. And in 939, he brought his army to the provincial government headquarters. This was supposedly to plead his case against his relatives. But he wound up fighting and eventually defeating the local governor. And then he claimed control of the province. Now, according to one account, an oracle told Masakado that he was now emperor and should therefore take over the rest of Japan. And whether or not one believes that oracle, Masakado quickly gained control over the eight eastern provinces of Japan. The government in Kyoto was alarmed. They didn't have an army with which to fight Taira no Masakado. Remember, the court had dissolved the conscript army in the late 700s, so they had to rely on nobles who could raise their own armies. So when Taira no Masakado was finally defeated, it was by his cousin Taira no Sadamori. So even though the imperial state eventually suppressed the rebellion, the incident actually accelerated the deterioration of central authority. The government rewarded Taira no Sadamori with court rank and official positions, so even in victory, Kyoto was just choosing sides in a family feud. Now those problems in the countryside, they only got worse. But there was also trouble brewing in the capital. Remember how, for centuries, the Fujiwara had ruled through pliant young emperors? 
Well, that began to break down in the 1060s with Emperor Gosanjo. He took the throne in 1068, and he did not have a Fujiwara mother. He was the first emperor in 170 years not to have a Fujiwara mother. So he was not beholden to a Fujiwara patron. In fact, Gosanjo moved against the Shouen, those tax-exempt estates used by the Fujiwara and other powerful families. He declared that all Shouen created after 1045 were illegal. And his son, Emperor Shirakawa, was even more independent. Not only did Shirakawa continue Gosanjo's campaign, he aggressively confiscated Shouen that he considered illegal. So it sounds like the emperors might be restoring the Ritsuro state. But in fact, it was the opposite. By the 11th century, even the imperial house was no longer interested in restoring the power of the ancient imperial state. Instead, Emperor Shirakawa created new shoen for himself and his allies. So with one hand, he dissolved the shoen of his enemies, and with the other, he promoted new exemptions from the imperial tax rolls. So by the 11th century, the imperial house is actually trying to beat the Fujiwara at their own game. In fact, Shirakawa imitated the Fujiwara in another way. Remember how the Fujiwara did not rule as emperors? Well, neither did Emperor Shirakawa. Instead, in 1087, at the peak of his power, Shirakawa abdicated, and then he went on to rule for decades as retired emperor. So Shirakawa started his own version of indirect rule. The Fujiwara had ruled as regents for emperors. So Shirakawa ruled as the retired father of a reigning emperor. And as emperor, he ruled for only 14 years. But as retired emperor, he held the reins of government for 43 years. Now, I'm sure this made sense to Shirakawa but it actually led to a spectacular succession crisis and a huge setback for imperial rule. The crisis occurred under Emperor Shirakawa's grandson, Emperor Toba. Emperor Toba chose to rule as retired emperor as well. And first, he put his son, Sutoko, on the throne. But then he changed his mind, and he put another son, Go Shirakawa, on the throne. The prefix go here is like the second, so go Shirakawa is Shirakawa the second. Now it's possible that Emperor Toba suspected that Sutoko was not actually his son, but in fact the son of his grandfather, the first Emperor Shirakawa. There were some very juicy rumors at court about which men had enjoyed the company of Sutoko's mother. In any case, when Toba died in 1156, he left two adult sons, Go Shirakawa and Sutoku, both of whom thought that they rightly should be emperor. They each called in their supporters, mostly warriors from the Taira and Minamoto clans, and Go Shirakawa's side won. Sutoku was sent into exile, and Go Shirakawa named one of his sons as emperor. And things look great for Goshirakawa, but not for long. The problem was that one of Goshirakawa's major supporters, Taira no Kiyomori, had major ambitions of his own. First, he moved against some of his military rivals. In 1159, he killed one of the leaders of the Minamoto clan. But then he began to encroach on the powers of the imperial court. He took several important titles, such as Dajo Daijin, Grand Minister or Prime Minister. But more ominously, he made one of his own daughters an imperial consort. And that meant that his grandson could become emperor. Now, Goshirakawa became alarmed by Taira no Kiyomori's ambition, and he tried to push back. But in 1180, Taira no Kiyomori indeed had his own grandson named Emperor. 
And at this point, although he was confined to his villa in Kyoto, Goshirakawa sent out word that he wanted to get rid of the Taira. So Taira no Kiyomori went from being Goshirakawa's protector to Goshirakawa's enemy. Now that call to arms galvanized all of Taira no Kiyomori's enemies, especially Minamoto no Yoritomo and Minamoto no Yoshitsune. Those were two sons of the Minamoto leader killed by Taira no Kiyomori. Now the fighting against the Taira lasted from 1180 to 1185, and when the dust had settled, Minamoto no Yoritomo was in control. Now Yoritomo was smart enough to learn from the mistakes of Taira no Kiyomori, and he took a strikingly different strategy. Rather than try to emulate the Fujiwara and get his own grandson named Emperor, in 1185, he cut a deal with Goshirakawa. Basically, Yoritomo said, to raise an army, I promised my men that I would guarantee their land claims if they fought with me. And I am going to do that. I'm going to take land and I'm going to give it to my men. Now, primarily, I'm going to reward them with land from our joint enemies, the Taira I defeated for you, Emperor Goshirakawa. But some of my men may have been working on your shoan for generations, basically serving as tax farmers for Kyoto courtiers. And if there's a dispute over their rights and duties, a dispute over how much of the harvest my men get to keep, I will hear it in my shogunal court. And now, in return, I, Minamoto no Yoritomo, I am not going to try and run Kyoto. I am not going to set up my grandson as emperor. I will stay out of your way. In fact, I'm going to set up my own capital in Kamakura. The imperial court and the courtiers can run Kyoto, and I will take care of my warriors. Now, Kamakura is over 250 miles away from Kyoto. So the Minamoto got their own capital in the Kanto region, that's the greater Tokyo area. And the imperial court got to keep its capital in Kyoto. Now looking back on this a millennium later, we call this the founding of the first shogunate, the Kamakura shogunate, because one of the titles Minamoto no Yoritomo received as a reward for his service was shogun, or generalissimo. Now, Ironically, Yoritomo did not think that shogun was his most important title. In fact, he didn't even get the title shogun until 1192. And like any important person in 12th century Japan, he had a portfolio of lofty titles. It was actually Yoritomo's successors, years later, that came to think of the title of shogun as the key title for warrior rule. At any rate, Yoritomo's victory in 1185 marked the founding of a new dynasty, a separate warrior dynasty distinct from the imperial court in Kyoto. So we can say that 1185 marks the end of the Heian period and the beginning of the Kamakura period. Now, Goshirakawa did not like the creation of a new power center, but it was clearly preferable to the alternatives. One alternative was Yoritomo seizing power Fujiwara style. The other threat was chaos, local warriors seizing as much land as they could amidst the chaos of civil war. And what Yoritomo offered was to rein in his men to ensure that they got rewarded, yes, but also to restrain them, to bind his warriors by the rule of law. And that was the lasting legacy of the 1185 settlement. The shogun did not replace the emperor, but he got a share of power in return for keeping order. And for historians, Minamoto no Yoritomo's great legacy lies not in his battlefield victories, but in the paper trail he created for warrior culture. Before the 1180s, we really have very little understanding of the countryside. We know that there were some sort of armed warriors who made sure that farmers handed over taxes, but the details are unknown. However, from the 1180s, 
the new government in Kamakura started keeping records of these warriors. Today we, we call these warriors samurai because they performed some military service. But the term samurai was actually rare in the 1100s. These men were more commonly called jito or military land stewards because their main function in peacetime was collecting income from shōen. And the government in Kamakura kept track of jito claims. If a jito thought that a Kyoto noble wasn't giving him his fair share of the harvest, then the jito was supposed to file a suit. And while the shōgun's courts did have a bias towards their own samurai, the shōgun was extremely strict with samurai who lied or forged records. And overall, this did restrain samurai from just seizing land. So practically, the 1100s are the start of warrior law, a separate legal system for the samurai. Now, another great legacy of the power struggles of the Heian period is cultural. The battles of the 1100s produced some iconic figures and some enduring works of literature. So let's spend the rest of today's lecture exploring that cultural legacy. One incredibly influential work compiled soon after this period is the Heike Monogatari, or the Tale of the Heike. It's a long ballad, and it was spread across Japan by wandering minstrels. Initially, these were largely blind monks. And it takes the story of the Taira and it turns it into a Buddhist parable. So in the Heike Monogatari, Taira no Kiyomori rises from relatively humble origins to reach the apex of power. But his excessive ambition leads to his downfall. His legacy falls to ashes. His family is scattered and destroyed. Now Heike Monogatari lets you know this from the first lines, which are both famous and beautiful. The sound of the Gion temple bells echoes the impermanence of all things. The color of the sala flowers reveals the truth that the prosperous must decline. The proud do not endure. They are like a dream on a spring night. In the end, the mighty fall. They are like dust before the wind. In the tale of the Heike, Taira no Kiyomori is punished for his hubris with a terrible fever. His fever is so intense that no one can stand to come near him. And when people try to cool him off with a bath, his fever boils the bath water. His wife has a dream that a flaming carriage has come from hell for Kiyomori, and then Kiyomori begins having seizures and dies. Another famous section of Heike Monogatari is the story of Atsumori. Now we can assume that this story is completely fictional but it's inspired countless prints, several plays. And it tells of a Minamoto warrior named Kumagai who sees a Taira noble fleeing from battle. So the Minamoto noble challenges him and says, where's your sense of honor? And the warrior turns back. Kumagai grabs him, throws him down from his horse, yanks off his helmet to take his head as a trophy. But he finds that the enemy soldier is a beautiful teenage boy, so beautiful and so refined that Kumagai's eyes fill with tears and he cannot kill him. But then he realizes that if he leaves the boy, the boy is Taira no Atsumori, then Atsumori will just be killed by another Minamoto soldier. So Kumagai says, I'd like to spare you, but there are Minamoto warriors all around and you can't possibly escape. And since you must die now, let it be by my hand, since I will offer prayers for your auspicious rebirth. Now, after Kumagai kills Atsumori, he laments, he says, nothing is as bitter as to be born into a warrior family. What a cruel thing I have done. Now, beyond the pathos of a warrior life, the story of Atsumori captures a sense of cultural inferiority of early samurai. Atsumori has a powdered face like a courtier and he has blackened teeth like a courtier. Under his armor, he has a flute. And Kumagai explains, there are many thousands of writers in our army, 
but I doubt that even one of them carried a flute to the battlefield. These court nobles are truly gentle and refined. And to me, this reflects an important historical duality, a tension, felt by both the Taira and the Minamoto. They were at the bottom of the Kyoto aristocracy, but at the top of the rural hierarchy of warriors. So they had a foot in each world. And that duality is also captured by another famous story from the 1100s, the story of Minamoto no Yoshitsune and Benke. They're probably the most famous warrior team in Japanese fiction. Yoshitsune is an historical figure, a competent general of the Minamoto clan, who helped his half-brother, Minamoto no Yoritomo, defeat the Taira. But then Yoritomo became suspicious of his half-brother, Yoshitsune. He declared Yoshitsune a traitor, he had him hunted down and killed. So Yoshitsune is a tragic hero. Now, to this historical outline, Japanese ballads added lots of intrigue and entertaining fictional details. They added a beautiful and loyal wife for Yoshitsune, Shizuka, and they gave Yoshitsune a loyal sidekick, Benke. And the combination of Yoshitsune and Benke wonderfully captures the duality of warrior rule in the 1100s. Because Yoshitsune is depicted as fair and lithe, refined, cultured, elegant, and almost androgynously beautiful, similar in many ways to Atsumori. He's part of the Kyoto elite. But his loyal sidekick, Benke, is tough, rugged, burly, hairy, crude, he reflects the unrefined but effective face of provincial samurai culture. And the stories of Yoshitsune and Benke have that opposites attract theme, something you find in a modern buddy movie. Now, Yoshitsune Benke lore is rich and broad, and it ranges from woodblock prints to comic books. In fact, one could probably do a complete course on Yoshitsune and Benke. But today I want to focus on just one snippet of the legend. They're meeting at Gojo Bridge, 5th Avenue Bridge in Kyoto. In rough outline, Yoshitsune was secretly visiting his family in Kyoto. And he needed to leave the city in disguise so as not to attract attention from Taira soldiers. So Yoshitsune pulls on a woman's cloak, and he's about to cross 5th Avenue Bridge. But at the other end of the bridge is Benke. Now, Benke is a defrocked monk, and he is a mountain of a man. He's more than six feet tall, and he has made it his mission to take 1,000 swords by challenging everyone who crosses Gojo Bridge. Now, when he sees Yoshitsune, Benke has already taken 999 swords, and he's about to let Yoshitsune pass because Yoshitsune looks like a woman. But then wait a minute. Yoshitsune's sandals are wrong, and this woman has a sword. So Benke says, you, Taira coward, give me your sword. And Yoshitsune says, I'm not a Taira, and I'm not a coward. And Benke says, well, I'll take your sword. And he attacks Yoshitsune, but he cannot hit him. So Benke swings his lance, but Yoshitsune keeps leaping out of reach, and Benke hacks the bridge to pieces, but he can't hit Yoshitsune. He chases Yoshitsune through the streets, but he can't catch him. In one account, the two burst into a temple, and they stop fighting long enough to read sutras, but it's competitive sutra reading, and then they go back to fighting. So finally, Benke says, I have never lost a battle. I've taken 999 swords, but I cannot get yours. And since I can't defeat you, I will have to become your loyal servant. And then the two become the most famous warrior duo in Japanese history. Now, years ago, I started looking for Yoshitsune Benke iconography. And I found it everywhere. There are no one kabuki plays about Yoshitsune and Benke. There are movies, TV miniseries, video games, and beyond that, I found Yoshitsune in an ad for a dry goods store from the 1920s, 
I found a hip hop duo in which one singer is Benke and the other is Yoshitsune, and they sing about a meeting on Gojo Bridge. And in Kyoto today, you can buy any number of Yoshitsune themed trinkets, key fobs, stickers, all sorts of souvenir junk. And if you go to Gojo Bridge, you will find a statue of Yoshitsune and Benke. So, what's so compelling about this story? Why has it proved so popular for so many years? I'll close with two suggestions. First, the story gives us two competing but complementary visions of masculinity. Benke is the more readily recognizable tough guy. He's a sort of Ernest Borgnine tough guy, and that was an important image for the samurai. But Yoshitsune's elegance, that evokes a Japanese love of a certain androgynous beauty. Just because Yoshitsune is deadly doesn't mean he can't also look slightly female. Now, trying to translate this into Western culture is difficult, but think of teen pop stars like Justin Timberlake as a teenager or, or Justin Bieber. The appeal of these teenage boys, no facial hair, lithe, graceful, coy, it's clearly male, but it's not Ernest Borgnine male. In fact, in Japanese TV miniseries about Yoshitsune, he was portrayed by a boy band pop star. But what's striking about Yoshitsune is that he's a warrior hero. In fact, he's the commander, not the sidekick, Benke, the more conventional tough guy. He's the loyal sidekick. Now, as a historian, I love how this captures a moment in time, this moment of transition from courtier culture to warrior culture. But thinking more broadly, the popularity of Yoshitsune and Benke also points to a certain acceptance of the fluidity of gender roles in traditional Japanese culture. Yoshitsune is one of the deadliest warriors in Japan, but if he cross-dresses, he could almost pass for a woman. And that androgynous beauty does not make him any less male. Another key feature of the story is the power of the warrior bond. In the legend, both men die, but their complete loyalty to each other makes them heroic. And this is a powerful theme in Japanese culture, the idea that loyalty can turn defeat into victory. Now, all cultures love tragic heroes. I don't think Romeo and Juliet would be the same if they successfully eloped and settled into quiet domestic life together. But in Japan, the Yoshitsune Benkei story has all the power of Romeo and Juliet, plus Robin Hood and Friar Tuck, with maybe some Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid thrown in for good measure. It's one of the most beloved stories of human devotion in the face of insurmountable odds. It's so powerful that one Japanese idiom, meaning root for the underdog, is hogan biki, literally to favor the captain. And captain was Yoshitsune's official military rank. So these stories, from the period of the decline of the imperial court and the rise of samurai culture, these are some of the most memorable and evocative stories in Japanese culture. And even today, they shape everything from figures of speech to high culture like no theater and to cheap tourist junk in the souvenir stalls of Kyoto.